So welcome again for those joining live and um, to those joining on the recording. You're joining the Communities Addressing Loneliness and Building Wellbeing event um, hosted by the Network of Wellbeing and Eden Project Communities. Um, so those joining live, I would love to invite us just very briefly, um, just for like a minute, maximum two minutes, to um, have a little brief mindfulness pause. And for those that don't like to practice or are a bit kind of unsure about mindfulness, um, no worries at all. It's really just um, a way of saying just kind of breathing and pausing to just help support us to arrive in this space. Um, and if you are familiar with mindfulness, then hopefully you enjoy this opportunity. So just inviting you to kind of check in with how you're sitting in your chair and just taking a few slightly deeper breaths just to help support you to physically kind of tune in with your body. Um, if you like, you can kind of gently lower your gaze away from the screen. Um, you can also, if you would like, close your eyes. Like I say, this is just going to be a very brief um, opportunity to tune in with yourself. And then just, again, inviting you to take a few deeper breaths. And just inviting you to allow yourself, just for this time that you're at this event, to just let go a little bit of the day that's just passed. Maybe you still feel quite full of all of the things you've been up to and yeah, all of the different pulls on your time and thoughts, but just inviting you to just let go of that just for a moment and just tune in to what inspired you to join this event this evening. So what was it that brought you to an event about communities addressing loneliness and building well-being? Just reflecting on that for a moment in yourself. And then just realizing that others here on this event are also likely drawn by similar inspirations. So just kind of feeling a little bit of that connection already with others, even though we're joining on other sides of the screen. And then with a final few deeper breaths, I'll invite you to open your eyes again if your eyes were closed or bring your eyes back up to the screen if they were lowered and uh, thank you very much for taking that brief pause together I know for me it can help me be much more um, present and so I hope it was supportive for you um, so yeah as mentioned I'm Flo from the Network of Wellbeing I'm co-hosting uh, this event this evening with Tracy Robbins from Eden Project Communities and I will hand over to Tracy to further introduce um, the event this evening. Over to you, Tracy. Hello and welcome, everybody. Um, and what an exciting Loneliness Awareness Week we're having already. This is my second event today. Um, my team and I at Eden Project Communities are uh, on, I suppose, the positive side of trying to bring people together and foster those connections and relationships and informal networks that help keep people buoyed and keep them going during times of loneliness. Um, so I've been working on the issue of loneliness since 2010, um, and maybe earlier, if you count the fact I was rather too being ginger at school. Um, but besides that, um, for me, it's a real passion, and actually working with the network of wellbeing, focusing on um, the connections and what we can all do about the issue around loneliness and the human response we need to it is really, really close to our heart. So um, I will be your safeguarding lead for the evening. So if anybody is um, feels overwhelmed or gets upset by the subjects or would like to chat afterwards, you can direct message me in the chat and I'll also pop my email in there so people can email me afterwards. I'm really happy to have a conversation and so are all the organizers of this event. Um, um, so if anybody's upset, do I'll keep an eye on you as well. And when we go into breakout room at the end, if people don't wish to, they can stay in the main room with me. So I just want to let you know, we all, emotions bubble up. I was on one earlier and I was talking about today is um, my dad's birthday. Um, and now and again, it's like, it does get overwhelming. I think I've been along, I've been alive longer without him now than with him, you know? So that mismatch of those connections can hit you when you don't expect it sometimes. 
groups. Um, so we're here for those people if you are hit by any of those emotions while we're in this session. Um, but I have the ultimate joy of introducing our first speaker, which is Kim. Now, I was fortunate enough to meet Kim in 2016, and I can assure you, although you won't know virtually, she gives the most amazing hug and has the best welcoming smile I've ever known and lights up a room. I also had the great fortune of meeting Jean and Gordon, her parents. Um, and the family at the time showed great love and resilience to all those people around them in what I can only imagine to be the darkest moments of their life. But since then, I've worked with Kim through the Joe Cox Foundation and the Great Get Together and the Monthly Community on lots of different issues to celebrate life and bring people together and work really hard. And now Kim's journey has taken yet another turn and she is now MP for Batley and Spen. And um, she is also the co-chair of the APPG on tackling loneliness, although I don't like the word tackle and I wish you'd change it, Kim. Um, and also the Connected Communities Chair. So I would warmly like to introduce um, Kim and hand over to Kim to say a few words for us today. Lovely, thank you so much, Tracy. Good evening, everybody. Hope you're okay. I'm giving you a big wave. I'm sending you all a massive Yorkshire hug wherever you are across the country. And beyond, actually, it's really good to see that we've got people joining from all over the place this evening. And it really is a pleasure to be here with you all um, in spirit, if not in person. Um, and thank you to Tracy and thank you to Flo for inviting me to join you this evening for what I think is a really special event um, as part of Loneliness Awareness Week. I really like the fact that you've drawn together loneliness and well-being because I think taking a holistic approach to this subject is really important. It's certainly everything that I believe in. I'm also really pleased that there's a lot going on this week for Loneliness Awareness Week. And, and like Tracy said, I've been to several events this week, um, uh, dropping today with the Mental Health Foundation who are still talking about loneliness after they did their um, Awareness Week in, back in May. I've been asked to do quite a bit of radio um, interviews about it. And so it's great that it's happening. So. Tracy's given me a great introduction there. Um, just to sort of add the details to that, um, some of you will possibly know me through my work at the Joe Cox Foundation. And Joe Cox was my sister. And again, for anybody who isn't aware, Joe was the MP for Batley and Spen who was murdered in June 2016. It's the sixth anniversary of Joe's murder this week, actually. So it's a, a tough week for me in lots of ways. Um, but it's great to be doing something so positive this week that I know Joe would be extremely, extremely proud of and pleased that it's happening. Um, prior to Joe being killed, my background was in the physical activity and, and health and well-being sector. So a lot of the issues that we're talking about tonight really bring together my, my two or three different lives that I've had. Um, and that's makes it really extra special for me. I used to work as a, a lecturer in health and well-being and also had my own business working as a personal trainer um, and almost a life coach, although that's a bit of a cheesy expression, I'm not that keen on, uh, but, but basically working with people around health and well-being. Um, and that's where I get my energy from, from people and from trying to help people. Um, so that's a little bit about what brought me to this subject, but, but really my work on loneliness started after Joe, Joe was killed. And, and after that horrendous day, we took the decision as a family that we wanted to do things to remember Jo in a really positive way. We wanted to remember how she lived rather than how she died. So we set up the Joe Cox Foundation and we started working on some of the issues that Joe cared about. And loneliness was one of those. And Jo got involved in working on loneliness because she'd had her own personal experience. And when she was a student, for example, when she went away to university, and we both experienced loneliness then. Jo went down to Cambridge and as a northern working class girl, she felt like a fish out of water. And because we'd been so close as kids, we were both really struggling. And it was before there were mobile phones or probably emails, actually, or anything like that. And we had some really tough times there. And I think that had really stayed with Jo. She also felt lonely, um, as many people do, after she gave birth to her first ch child. So as a new mum or as a new parent, that can be quite a lonely place to be. And then on top of that personal experience, when Jo was knocking on doors to, to be our MP, what she found was that lots of people wanted a chat 
they wanted a smiley face they wanted an ear they wanted someone to talk to and it sort of really resonated with her that often they didn't want to talk about politics goodness me who does but they wanted to have that conversation with somebody and to be listened to so i think because of that joe started the work on loneliness on a cross-party basis with seema kennedy on the conservative benches and then after joe was killed Rachel Reeves, who was a friend of Joe's, um, said, we can't let this go. We've got to keep this work going. And she started working with SEMA, um, again, on a cross-party basis to really turbocharge the work that Joe had started. And as a result of that, we ended up with the Joe Cox Commission on Loneliness, which led to the world's first ever Minister for Loneliness and the world's first ever government strategy for tackling loneliness. So all that work was absolutely brilliant. And it was building on the work, as Tracy alluded to earlier on, that so many amazing people had been doing for, for years before that. And it just needed that kickstart. And I guess for me, it was one of those moments where I really realised as much as I hadn't been a political animal until that point, that politics can make a really big difference on some important issues that, that the country faces. And if you get an MP who is prepared to champion something for you, it, it can really get things going. Um, through the work that we did through Joe's Foundation, we did a lot around um, building strong communities. And as Tracy has mentioned already, the great get together was at the heart of that. And this was the weekend of activities that we do on Joe's birthday, which is the 22nd of June. And really this was an idea around connecting people, bringing people together, remembering Joe, but also building those communities where we all feel that we have a sense of identity and a sense of belonging. So that's kind of a bit of a work up until, I guess, last year for me. And then last year, I took the um, difficult decision, probably bonkers decision, to put myself forward to be the MP for Batley and Spen, the area that Joe represented, the area where we both grew up and I've lived all my life. And after a quite a not particularly pleasant experience of a by-election, I managed to get, get into post as the MP for Batley and Spen. It wasn't the plan, far from it. But what I'm now doing is thinking about how I can make a difference on the issues that I care about, the issues that Joe cared about, the issues that the country needs us to address with a very different hat on. And that's why, as I think Flo said, I, um, I now co-chair the APPG on loneliness and connected communities. And I was honored to be asked to do that. I do it with my parliamentary colleague and friend, Tracy Crouch, who was the world's first ever minister for loneliness. And she sits on the Conservative benches. And it's a really good example of how, you know, despite our differences, whether they're political or otherwise, you can work with people on issues that you both have a shared um, emotional attachment to. And I play football with Tracy in the all-party women's football team as well. She's pretty good at football. I'm not so good, but I have lots of fun. Um, so that, that's how I really came to be looking at loneliness with, with my, my different hat on. But one thing I want to be clear about on this issue is it's the voluntary sector that leads the way on this stuff, um, not politicians. We need to be led by you and we need to follow your example. And having done this for a few years in the voluntary sector, I feel that really, really deeply. And I would encourage you all to keep lobbying your MPs, lobbying people in government and local government, very much in local government as well, to keep loneliness and connection on their agendas because it needs to be there. Um, you're the experts, you know, I, I don't think there's there's experts in parliament really on this on this stuff. You guys are the ones who need to feed us the information. Um, and I think now by you doing that, it's a really good opportunity for us to revisit that strategy that was produced in 2018. Have the government been doing what they said they would do? Let's be fair, in the middle of all that, we've had the pandemic, we've had the lockdowns, which dreadful, dreadful, dreadful in so many ways. I guess one positive that came out of it from a loneliness perspective is it got people talking about loneliness again, because sadly, more people than ever have experienced loneliness and isolation for the worst possible reasons. So I think we are at a moment in time now where we can really go for that turbocharging again of this agenda. I'm also really keen and happy that the APPG is about loneliness and connected communities because there is a much broader uh, narrative around loneliness and that is the one of human connection. And I think we've got to keep talking about that as well. 
And I think it's really about taking a holistic approach to these issues. And again, that's one of the things I'm pushing through the APPG is, you know, we need to be looking at everybody having a role to play in addressing the issue of loneliness, building strong connected communities, whether you are in government, local or national, whether you are in the voluntary sector, which is where I believe, as I've said, that the beating heart of this work is, but also the private sector as well. So let's start looking at employers and businesses to see what they can do to work in this area. Um, I've talked a little bit about my own personal experience of loneliness when we were teenagers and, and when Joe went away to university. I think for me also what I've realised over the past few years and actually probably the last few months as well is there's two really important intersections that we need to consider probably more deeply. One is the intersection between grief and loneliness and I think again building on top of what's happened for so many families during the pandemic I think we've got a lot of unprocessed grief across our country and I think that's something we need to be really aware of and the loneliness that that can create. I think the second really important point is the intersection between loneliness and mental health and we don't define loneliness as a mental health condition but there is very very clear evidence that people with mental health concerns can be extremely lonely and similarly if you are extremely lonely it can lead to mental health problems. So I think these intersections are really important and it's everything I believe in again around taking that holistic approach to the problem and I think you know we've got to be quite clear in what our asks are to the general public on these sorts of things and I guess two or three things that I always talk about are, are not being afraid or embarrassed or ashamed to ask for help and again as we you know move forward from the, the worst times of the pandemic really saying that to people quite you know, blatantly, you know, if you have lost loved ones, if you are feeling lonely because of that, if you're still nervous about reintegrating with society and getting back to the things that you used to do, it's a real strength to ask for help. And I'm the worst at this. I'm absolutely crap at asking for help. <laughs> but we've got to encourage that and say, you know, it's a strength. It's not a weakness. Um, and also, again, just having those those open conversations um, with people who we think might be struggling. And I've done a few things, I think I was on uh, radio today talking about it, saying, you know, if, if you've gone back into some of the stuff that you were doing before lockdown and you notice someone who isn't there, let's all try and reach out and, and, and you know, knock on the door, give them a ring and say, you know, we're, we're getting back to the choir or to church or to tennis or whatever it might be and, and, and gradually pull those people back in. I guess the other thing to finish on really is examples of where this is done really well and and the honest answer to that is there's so many and I'm so proud of the many organizations that do stuff in this space and that's from the really big like the British Red Cross um, and, and the co-op and, and, and organizations like that and like the Eden communities you know quite big organizations but to the really small hyper local work that goes on and and I've seen a lot of that in Batley and Sven in our community um, in the last few years and I know there's many examples whether it's the friendly benches or the the coffee caravan in Suffolk or you know the, those little hyper local groups that do amazing things you are so important to this work and you know I think we all need to acknowledge that and be incredibly grateful for that you've also got those national organizations that have a local uh, remit as well things like the Royal Voluntary Service Age UK re-engage you know where they are national organisations, but the local work is really important. And I've attended loads of fantastic events um, for some of those organisations. I think we also need to give a big shout, shout out to the Marmalade Trust, who were actually the people who invented Loneliness Awareness Week. And it's fantastic that they've done so much. Um, Amy, who, who is the fantastic lady behind that, I think sadly has got COVID at the moment. Oh, no. Um, but someone from, from the Marmalade Trust was in Parliament today, and it was lovely to be able to meet up with her. And um, I think the other thing is looking at, Organisations that address loneliness quite explicitly and quite directly, but also then looking at ways that we can do more of the loneliness um, by stealth, tackling loneliness by stealth. And for me, that's anything within your communities, whether you're a sports club, whether you're a choir, whether you're a knit and natter group or whatever you are. So, you know, I, I think just the voluntary sector as a whole needs to be respected a lot more and it needs to be valued a lot more, however you go about these things. Um, so I guess that's it really in summary. I suppose that the, the action points for me is that, you know, let's keep loneliness on the agenda, but let's talk about it broadly around human connection and how important that is to every single one of us. Keeping that message going that we can all do something 
about this. You know, we can all do something, whether it's organising a big lunch or whether it's knocking on our neighbour's door and, you know, taking a cake round. Whatever it is, there's something that we can all do. Um, and, yeah, and thank you for all the work that you're doing on this because it really, really is very, very important. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much, Kim, for such a, yeah, like moving and personal and also really informative and inspiring talk. It's, um, yeah, really a wonderful start to our time together this evening. Um, and just to let everyone know that because uh, we're, we're really thankful and lucky to have Kim with us this evening during such a busy week as Loneliness Awareness Week. So um, Kim will be staying with us for about another five or max 10 minutes. So if you've got any um, any uh, questions for Kim, I see a few have come in through the chat box. We'll try and ask a few questions for Kim now before we go to our further two speakers for the evening. Um, so do put those in the chat box now and we'll try and get through uh, a few of those questions for you, Kim, if that's okay. I'm really, uh, it's wonderful that you talked about the role of organizations big and small, because we're gonna be uh, handing over later to Lindsay and Nula, our further speakers, who will be talking about that in practice. So, um, but yeah, that's a really great kind of lead into what we're gonna be sharing later in the event. Um, but just to um, start with a kind of broad question about the maybe of, of course loneliness can be a very personal and a very individual issue in a lot of ways so um a, one question is what issues can arise when trying to address such a personal issue at a kind of government and policy level um i think it's remembering that um even though it sometimes doesn't feel like it politicians are people too <laughs> although in this place you wouldn't always know it. But anyway, but, but remembering that probably at some point, everybody in this place, in Parliament, has, has experienced loneliness or will know somebody who has. And I guess, again, that's what I always try and do. And, and I, I'm not institutionalised enough yet to, to not be able to do it, is looking at the real world and then looking at the world of Westminster and the world of politics and, and making those human connections and sharing those human stories is really important. So trying to, you know, again, as I've tried to do tonight, and I always try and do is give my own personal experiences in the political arena as well. Yeah. Um, now, interesting, I'm working on the online safety bill at the moment as well. And it's really easy to think the online safety bill is up here. And, it, you know, we need to give examples of what the manifestations of, of political policy are in the real world. And I think that's something I always try and do. Does that does that make sense? makes complete sense and it really helps to um, bring the issues home like you say and show the impact that it has on on people's day-to-day -day lives and in a lot of ways so many um, political issues are also so, of, of course such direct personal issues you know so I think with loneliness that's that it becomes even more important to remember those those human aspects that you've talked about um a question from um helen is about um the kind of, you mentioned that the voluntary sector is the beating heart of addressing isolation and loneliness but there can be a lot of challenges in the kind of the funding landscape particularly in the northeast um how would you recommend that this is addressed in order to continue this vital work helen asks i think that's a really important point and i think that's partly where holding the government to account is important you know, there were a lot of promises made in 2018 and part of that was about investment. Let's make sure that that investment is being followed through. So that's where lobbying your MP is, is really important. And um, I think there's a bigger issue with the voluntary sector and funding and, and having experienced it myself, this really resonates with me is short term funding, you know, six months, 12 months. What can you actually do in six or 12 months? You're just getting going, aren't you? So I think we all need to lobby funders to look more at long term funding. Um, I'm doing something in the constituency in a couple of weeks' time with, with sports clubs and organisations, and that's one of the big points I'm going to make there to the National Lottery and to Sport England, is there's no point giving those little short-term grants because you spend half that time writing the next funding bid or worrying about where the next money's coming from. So I think lobby MPs and, and, and local government as well, you know, make sure that if, if there's any money coming from, from the council, that they take a long-term view on it, because a lot of this stuff probably a bit naughty saying this, but he's doing a lot of the council stuff for them. So they should be prepared to put money behind it with a long-term strategy and with a long-term plan. Um, and I think make that the more that the more of you and, and us make that point to funders, I think the more it will eventually sink in. And I think the other point, sorry, just a quick point on that as well is sometimes 
uh, I know there's an issue in the chat, a, co a question in the chat there about the word loneliness. Sometimes you might be a bit more stealthy in how you do things. So you might use a bit of a hook, which might be around the creative arts, or it might be around sport, or it might be around something else. And it's kind of doing that addressing loneliness and connection, you know, more subtly. Um, and it ticks other boxes as well. I mean, I, I, we do a lot of stuff around in the foundation around cohesion. You know, so you, you're doing community cohesion, but you're also addressing loneliness and, and lots of other issues as well. So be a bit more creative, I think, about how you design your projects. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. And looking at that kind of holistic, integrated approach. Um, so I think I'm, I'm aware um, that we're short of time. So maybe we're going to um, I'll take uh, one more question that's come from from Jackie around um, kind of mapping the different types of connected and resilient communities so is uh, and this maybe is a question for you but also like we're going to go on to you know share with each other and connect with each other so Jackie asks have you thought about or got any views on community mapping to help create more connected and resilient communities helping people to find the opportunities resources and places to connect with each other and more so maybe that's a question for you Kim but also to to share with uh, you know for us to reflect on throughout this event if others have views on that as well. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think there's two things there. I'm not in exactly sure which bit Jackie means, but there's the national piece around that, connecting the connectors. And, and certainly one of the things that I was really proud of that Joe's Foundation did during lockdown was set up something called the Connection Coalition, which I think some people have heard of. And this was doing just that. This was a national mapping exercise around who is doing this work on loneliness and human connection. And that is still going. So if anyone wants to find out more about the Connection Coalition, I would suggest getting in touch with, with the Joe Cox Foundation around that. Yeah. Um, and, and again, that, that comes back to again the point about funding. If we join together, we've got a much louder voice and a more powerful voice. So I think that's one thing. I think in terms of um, what that looks like at a local level, I guess it's getting yourself out there and meeting other people and organizations who are doing things in that space. Um, I mean, I, I'm doing that now as the MP, but I did it before through, through Joe's foundation. And one of the things that I realized really quickly was you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There will be other people doing this good stuff. But one of the weaknesses of people in the voluntary sector is we're not always very good at blowing our own trumpets. So sometimes it's a question of finding those people and then joining the dots. And again, when it comes to funding, you know, I was used to encourage do a joint funding bid. So it might be the local sports club and the local um you know organization who do something around arts and crafts could you join something together could you do it with a young persons group could you do a project or an event that brings people together in that in that community so there's the national piece around connecting organizations and again i mean this is what tonight's about isn't it forget me wittering on Jot, meet each other join each other in the chat and and you know you've got a massive network here of groups across the country get to know each other and have that powerful voice together Thank you so much, Kim. That's such a lovely point to kind of uh, lead us into the rest of our event this evening. And yeah, we'll definitely share the link to the Connection Coalition in our follow-up email um, so that people can look into that. And definitely we'll spend some more time connecting with each other this evening. So just want to say a really warm uh, um, and big thank you to you for taking the time to share with us this evening. And um, yeah, feel free to stay as long as you um, are able to, of course, but I know that you might need to drop off at some point. I do, I do need to go for it, but I just want to say a massive thank you to you. Massive thank you to Trace and to everybody on the call tonight. Thank you for everything that you do. It really does make a difference. And I know it can be hard sometimes, particularly when you are in a small organization, there's only a few of you. you just keep going, keep going, because you can do it. <laughs> you can tell right. you used to be a coach. Bye, thanks, thanks, thanks for the for the pep talk. So, uh, so with those uh, inspiring words from Kim, um, we will move on to our uh, next lovely speaker of the evening, which is uh, Lindsay. So, I'm just going to give Lindsay uh, Kaysen a brief introduction. Lindsay's from the Empowerment Charity, and she's the service manager and is working to help reduce loneliness through connecting the community on various projects together with her team. So we're gonna hear more about her work and that's an example in practice of some of the wider issues that Kim was talking about there. So over to you, Lindsay. Great, thank you. Um, gosh, uh, following Kim is like really difficult because a lot of my notes that I've made, uh, the top tips, she sort of just covered them, but that's fine. I'm still going to go ahead. Um, so I um, sort of entered into the um, loneliness and isolation industry, I suppose, um, when Tracy Crouch came about because um, I worked with the British Red Cross. 
So um, they kind of rolled out a, a sort of initiative really called the Community Connectors and um, I applied for that position and got it, which was amazing because um, in Blackpool, where, I'm, where I am at the moment, um, to me, there wasn't much going on specifically on loneliness and isolation. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my work journey, though, before that, because I think, you know, there's lots of different people on the line. And I think that my career has been so all over the place. And I think that's kind of made me who I am today. And I think I'm best placed to do what I'm doing. So um, I started off um, as a photographer, so I had a photography degree and started being a photographer for Blackpool Council. So I was running around the town photographing um, either cracks in pavements or on the Blackpool illumination stage, which was absolutely terrifying, as you can imagine. Um, and after a couple of years, I decided it's good, but I need more connection. And, and I experienced that loneliness and isolation myself. Obviously, looking back now, I, I can see what it was. But, you know, being a sole trader, it's very difficult um, to get that connection, um, especially when you're young and all your friends are going out and maybe having a party. And then you're like, oh, I can't do that because I've got to get up the next day. You know, it, it's quite difficult. Um, so I started um, looking at different funding, but what was funny, my friend said, uh, you should apply for an Arts Council grant, and I'd never heard of the Arts Council, I had no idea what the Arts Council was, and um, I had a look, and I thought, oh, that'd be nice, I, I, that'd be really lovely, I'd be able to bring people together and do photography and creative things, so I just wrote this bid and sent it off, and then randomly, um, I got a phone call from my mum saying there's a massive brown envelope and I was like what is it what's in it open it and I've been awarded for like £10,000 and I thought oh my god like I'm gonna actually have to do something now so it was really um, the start of me working in the community and, and just bringing people together and I kind of realised that the actual activity it didn't really matter what it was it was actually the things that happened when you just brought people together to do some shared activity and that's really the the running theme of, of some of the stuff I've done over the last couple of years really but um it was fantastic I had a great time um and then it finished and I thought oh no what now so I carried on working in the community and as I say that led me to working with the British Red Cross where I, I learned very very much specifically on loneliness and isolation it all kind of made sense then the work I'd done in the community before that that that's what it is about it is is reducing that loneliness through a social connection of, of some sort um so yeah that that ran for two years and it was a fantastic experience I learned a lot I met a lot of people and I realized that I wanted to do more in Blackpool and that's how I found empowerment charity uh, my boss is on the line at the moment, so I'm trying not to look at him, to be honest. <laughs> I hope I'm going to do the pitch right here. But um, Empowerment Charity it was just a very sort of, it seemed quite a quiet, amazing uh, charity that was doing so much work that no one knew about. And I was really gobsmacked when I walked in because I just felt really welcome and, and like I found people that were doing things that were amazing and I just kind of wanted to be with them. So I was really lucky to um, receive a fund, which meant I could then start a service at Empowerment. And I was very lucky that my boss, who's a CEO, decided it was a good idea as well. So very, very pleased about that. So I'll just talk now about Empowerment Charity and the work that we do. So um, Empowerment advocate for people. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, we advocate. So we advocate for adults. We advocate for children. Uh, we have a lived experience team, so the lived experience team are people with multiple disadvantaged backgrounds that are now, you know, out there advocating for, for people that have been in their positions. Um, we work with children who are victims of domestic abuse um, and we do lots of different projects as well. So we're working on the Safer Streets project at the moment. So that's a little bit about empowerment, but my service specifically is around loneliness and isolation. And that's really what I wanted to talk about because... I love my projects and I love all the people that I work with for various different reasons. So my service started off called Bess and it was Talk to Bess. So I wanted it to not look or sound like a service, um, mainly because some of the people that I've been working with um, had 
between 10 and 15 um, services involved in their life. So I didn't want to create another service. I wanted to make sure that I was offering something a little bit different. And um, we started and then all of a sudden the pandemic hit and I was like, oh no, now what? <laughs> so I started Best Buddies, which was a telephone befriending service. So there wasn't one in Blackpool before. And um, so I created Best Buddies and we went from about 15 people that we were helping to 150 in like two weeks. So it was really quite um, extraordinary, really, because um, people were reaching out, which was, again, amazing in itself. Um, so that ran up until January this year. Um, and along the way, new projects emerged. So we have um, a project in an area of Blackpool called Claremont which is a very deprived area, but there's amazing people that live there that do a lot of amazing things. So we've kind of taken on a building there, um, a community centre, an old library space, and we run a digital group with men. But I can tell you there's not much digital stuff that goes on because um, we've been fishing, we've done barbecues, we've done gardening, they've had a lot of moaning, they've had brews, they've done all sorts. Um, but again, it's it's, just saying we're going to do a digital group just specifically aimed at men and obviously lots of men come forward which was great but you know they are the advocates they go out they speak to their neighbours they now speak to different people that are just walking past and say you know do you want to come in do you want to have a brew with us you know and and that for me is is the amazing part really about the bringing those people together but on a specific subject so specifically those men who were not able to connect with anybody else in a digital way um another project that i'm working on at the moment is elliot's place project so um i am going to talk a little bit about suicide at the moment um, but we do have lovely tracy here as a as our safeguarding so um please reach out if you feel that you need to um Elliot was a young man in Blackpool who sadly lost his life to suicide. And um, we'd been speaking about um, wanting to work with young men in Blackpool uh, for quite a long time, really, but there hadn't really been the right kind of opportunity to do that. Obviously, we don't want to duplicate work. So um, we spoke with Elliot's family uh, one week after he'd lost his life. and. As a result, um, we now have fundraised and we have a huge building. I say huge, it's two containers, but we have a huge space. We have a building in the empowerment garden. And we literally today just took on our second member of staff. And we are creating a community of young men who can support each other through any sort of mental health issues that they might have, any sort of anything that they want to do I'm just going to help to facilitate that because there is nothing in Blackpool and um, it's really difficult to to hear that the work that we're doing is is new and needed because I thought there was other things happening and that's really difficult but it, it's an answer in itself it gives me an opportunity to obviously do something about that um, as, as a side of that, we have um, held our first event for people that have experienced a, a loss and a bereavement through suicide, which is going to become a yearly thing. And that's then led on to writing a strategy for Blackpool. Um, so there's lots and lots of things going on that are specifically aimed at, at people that experience loneliness. Um, we do lots of other fun things. We do craft groups. We have a chatty cafe every Christmas. We had a walking group recently, um, and I'm sure there's many more things to come. So I can't see the time, um, and I'm probably trying to rush myself a little bit here, but I just wanted to give you a quick top 10 tips, because um, I think that's always handy when you come onto one of these um, webinars. So um, the first five are general wellbeing tips that I've taken for myself. And then the other five are practical. As I say, uh, Kim beat me to it on a few of them, but I'll quickly run through them. So I'd say my first tip is to go with your gut. So uh, you usually write. And I think that's really, really um, important because sometimes you, you doubt yourself and actually you know best because you're, you're the person that's best placed. And if you don't um, go with your gut and you learn a lesson, then you've kind of gone with your gut at the same time. 
Um, number two is it's okay to fail. Um, so it really, really, really doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, which sometimes we might not do things because we think that others who are watching in the sidelines might say something. Who cares? Just go for it. At the end of the day, you're doing it. They're not. And it's fine if you fail. It really is. Um, number three is to be brave. So it can be really, really tough at times when you're working out there in the community and you're on your own or you're just starting off or you've got some crazy wacky idea that you think I'm going to go for this what do you think you know just do it just be brave because I just think that um you, you'll look back and see what you've achieved and think gosh like I'm glad I didn't give up on that um number four is be different so um basically my inspiration comes from um going to random places and doing random things so even just getting on a train or a bus or going to a different town or looking at um in the library you know just keep an open mind because inspiration will come you know if you're feeling like you're having a lull in your ideas or you're not sure about an idea just I would say just go and do something a little bit different and I think that it, it will come out eventually or just bank the idea just put it to the side because it will come up at some point um number five is definitely look after yourself so um you obviously probably on here are there some people that do every single part of their business or their community group um, just make sure you you set your boundaries you know turn your notifications off at eight o'clock and don't turn them on till eight in the morning um, and, and my quick top five uh, practical uh, tips are basically they're all free so that's a good that's a good start I always think um, I would definitely say stick to one or two socials and just refine what you've got because um, sometimes you feel like you've got to be on everything. You don't. You just need to be on one or two and do it do it really well. Um, look for free training, even if it's not in your area of work. So you might use it someday. There's loads of free training out there at the minute. I've seen loads online because obviously of the pandemic. So just try and sign up for it. Eden is a great example. I've been to nearly everything, so I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, number three is network. So um, I know Kim mentioned the Connection Coalition. I, I was part of that and it was amazing. And I met so many different people. Um, just network, just go to everything. Just look what's happening in your local area, even if it's just like a book club. Just go down because you honestly never know who is going to be there and what connection that they could give you for, you know, for yourself as well, but just for, for, for your work. Um, volunteer is number four. Definitely get out there and do one day, even if it's just at a festival or um, helping out in a cafe. Again, people and their stories will give you that inspiration that you might need. Um, and number five is um, change is possible and no idea is too crazy. Just go for it. That's what I say. And, and my boss will probably vouch for me on this, but I'm always going with crazy ideas and they always come off in the end and they're always the best. So that's me. I don't know if I've gone over on time. I'm sorry, Flo. Um, but yeah, thank you. No worries at all. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I'll hand over to Gronya to ask you a few questions. Lindsay, thanks for that. It was particularly those top tips. So useful. And we have had a few questions um, beforehand and also during the chat. So I just want to start off with Sally Harlan's question, which is how do you reach out to people or identify them um, when they're needing help? Um, quite often people don't realise that they're lonely or isolated or don't want um, people to approach them and maybe refuse help. What do you do in that respect? Um, there's a few different things really. Um, sometimes um, people come to me by way of a referral, which is sort of usually the kind of social prescribers or the, the medical side of things. That's fine, obviously, because it, it's really helpful. Sometimes I randomly get, I probably get once or twice a year, I get one email of someone saying I'm lonely and I need some assistance. And that's always really great because um, you know, someone's had that, taken that first step. But I completely understand what you're saying when you say, how do you actually get to people who are isolated? Because usually they are actively isolating themselves. All I can say is, is that if you start to put things on in different areas, so if you just do a random 
I don't know, a uh, coffee morning or um, put a, a, a Facebook post out there and say, you know, we're going to meet up here and we're going to do a walk. Please come along. It, it does start to kind of gather a bit of momentum as you go because people start to talk to other people and build the confidence. It, you only need like one or two people to come to anything that you put on. If you're expecting 100 or 25, then that's fine. But if one comes, that's one more person. And when you build that confidence in that one person, I guarantee when they go home, they might see someone and go, Actually, I'm just going to say hi to them across the road. Or if you're even in a shop, you know, um, well, what what are you up to tonight? You know, any any sort of connection and showing that kindness, I think it's quite um, infectious and uh, in a really good way, in a positive way. Um, but yeah. Uh, and how, how, that's really good, thank you. How do you involve users in the design and kind of how you choose which projects to run? So that's an amazing question. Thank you. Everything that we do at Empowerment is co-produced, which basically means we don't do something just because we think that it needs to happen. So, for example, with Elliot's Place, we know that there is a need because we see statistics and things like that that are really um, not, not the best things to be looking at. But you can see there's a need. But then, OK, well, what is it they actually want? So we built the space. The space is, it just kind of looks like a house. It doesn't look like a bit of a service. It's a chill out space, I guess. But then in the in the actual design of what is Elliot's Place going to offer, we've actually invited young men. I wasn't there. I'm, I'm a lady, obviously. But um, we have young men um, and a, another man facilitated. And we said, right. So what's good and what's bad? What's your experience? And they just had a general conversation with a youth worker around, you know, what, what's, your, what's your experience been? So, you know, oh, well, at Elliot's Place, will there be a reception? Absolutely not. Oh, good, because we don't like walking up to reception. Great, that's good. So uh, will we need a referral? Well, no, we won't have a referral process, but we will have some things in place to keep you safe. All right, okay, we don't mind that. And so this next year, really, as I said, we've literally just got our second member of staff today. Um, those two guys, because we, we have employed two, two young men, actually, um, they're going to be chatting to the guys over this next year, and we will learn and work and adapt and change so that it is fully for that person, because there is literally no point in me saying that's what you young lads need, because I'm not a young lad and I've not walked in their shoes. So it, it will be user-led, basically. That That's really helpful. I mean, we just lost Sally during that. She's just rejoined us again. Um, but um, one of the other questions was around how you monitor effectiveness. I think you've answered that to some degree there and what you've been saying about how you involve the young people in shaping those projects. But thinking more generally, if people had to do two things, what would you suggest? Because I know funders ask for evaluation and monitoring effectiveness, but you know, what's the thing that has given you the most benefit that you've done? What's the what? Sorry. What type of monitoring have you done that you oh, find monitoring? Most sorry, so my accent. <laughs> no, I kind of got it, but I was thinking I just want to double check. Um, so monitoring and evaluation—they are like the bane of my life. I'm really lucky that in some um, of our funders, we've been able to provide video content, images, and case studies as the evaluation. Um, what would I say the two things are? I would say um, there's no harm in just sitting and chatting to somebody and asking if it's okay to make some notes because nobody likes to fill out evaluation feedback forms and no one wants to do an online um, survey look at the things that you don't like to do so if like you stood in um tesco's and you're going out of the out of the um shopping and you don't you don't want to be stopped to be talked to about something to do with whatever that cause might be you might stop if people look a bit friendly they've got um, some because this is just an example that I did the other day actually some some knitting stuff there and then I just chatted to people really and I said well what is they said oh I don't really like giving to charity I said well I'm not asking you to give me anything I'm just asking about 
how are you today? Oh, right. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, actually I've got this problem and I could do with a bit of support. And so it really, for me, it, it would be just to, just to talk to people. And then you sort of say, is it okay if I take your information? Because I need to just put this into whatever it might be. And, and usually people are more than happy to, to give you that information. But yeah, I, I don't have any kind of like definitely do a survey and definitely do this because I think just think about what you don't like to do and, and do the opposite. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's no, it's like okay. Hard. Thank you. That's so good. Thank you very much. I'm just going to take the chance now to move on um, to Nula, um, our other speaker. Um, so just to give everyone a little bit of context, when we were designing the session today, and should I just say as well, thank you so much, Lindsay, for that. It's so very useful. Um, when we were designing the session today, we wanted to have a balance of projects kind of that are at a larger scale and maybe things that we can do as individuals. Um, so we're inviting Nula O'Toole today, who's an Eden Project Communities Network member. Um, she's also very active in her own community in Northern Ireland. Um, before I introduce and, and bring Nula on to speak, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, there was a popularised um, saying during the pandemic, and that was, you know, around how we're all in the same storm, but not necessarily in the same boat. And um, I think that um, what Nula has done um, with her project that she started at a local level, um, and she's going to come on and introduce it herself, so I don't want to spoil that, um, really did something around recognising that, you know, if you were in a good place, you could do something. But actually, even if you weren't feeling that great yourself, doing something positive can really change your mood and your feelings, maybe, of loneliness and maybe help you feel more connected as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Nula, who is very definitely a battery charger, something that um, makes a big difference in, you know, in reaching out and connecting in communities. So over to you, Nula, just to say a little bit about um, what you did and why you got started with the Kindness Post Box, please. Hello, thank you, Grania. First of all, everybody, I have imposter syndrome, okay? I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew when the pandemic happened that I had to stay indoors and I was getting lonely. So if I was getting lonely, other people were getting lonely. And then I was reading stories to uh, nursing home residents and we got chatting with the, the staff and they were saying how the morale was shifting down and nobody could come in and everybody was getting very isolated and Basically, the cheese was coming off everybody's cracker. So I thought, that's not good. And then I heard something that really just flipped the lid. And it was that there's a wee man, local, and he lives in his own home and writes himself a letter every month. So the postman will knock the door. And I thought, that's not right. That's not right. So I thought, I'm the postman's daughter, we'll make a post box and we'll stick a rainbow on it. And that's just what we done. And we thought, right, well, this is going to last a week. And we'll have delivered two letters and I'll feel good and the loneliness will leave me. Great. And that did not work because we put a post box into the shop, our local shop, for two weeks and the school brought these letters in. And then we delivered it to a nursing home, which was great. And then the nursing home, collectively, all the residents, John would write a line and Mary would write a line and done a collective letter and sent it back, which we thought, oh, OK, this might be going a wee bit further than we originally thought. So then we thought, right, OK, the strangest thing happened. My son said, Ma, that's a good idea. That does not happen very often. So I thought, oh, oh, hello, I'm going to chase this rainbow. So he got involved. We set up a wee Facebook group because I thought, well, if I'm five and I've drawn you a letter or a picture or made something like this, I want to know where it went. So we basically done a Facebook group just for the kids. And then people outside our area started to get in contact with us and say, could we do it? And I was like, oh, okay. This is what a snowball looks like. 
So we had to set up, we thought, right, I don't want to get into any GPR or keeping details or killing dead things. So we just set up a little template system where there's a flyer, there's a face group book. That's how you keep a record of all the letters and how many residents you've met. And we basically pair a school with a nurse home, nursing home, and they send letters back and forth to each other. And then my friends started to get involved and one of them made me a t-shirt. And then we absolutely lost the run of ourselves entirely because we realized very quickly that we could get out for tea and cake when we delivered the post boxes to the schools. I am corruptible for tea and cake. It is a sin, I know. So we bring the, the box out to a school. We leave it for them, with them for a week. They make these gorgeous drawings. We bring it to the nursing homes and the residents. And, and then we started to realize people who weren't actually in nursing homes, they were still lonely. So then I kind of, well, I got in contact with Alison at Southwest Age Partnership who goes around and, and visits people in their own home. So we made a smaller box. And that now goes round in the back of her car so that John up in Balik will write a wee letter to maybe Mary John up in, in Fermanagh or whatever. And we thought, oh, this is good. It's going well. We have one box in a mobile box and we've delivered maybe a couple of letters. And now we are 14 months later. We have delivered 10,640 letters to over 6,500 residents. That's a lot of cake. But people now, when we come up to the nursing homes or they're like this, they know what they're getting. And they're actually wallpaper in their little rooms and writing back. And then we've realized that people that from the nursing homes and the schools were, yeah, let's keep this going. So, at Christmas, we done nursing, we done nursing home bespoke campers. There was not a bit of barn brack or a scone in it. Nursing home residents want drumsticks. They want maracas. And again, we started out with absolutely nothing. And we have most of it left, thankfully. We just, the community just got involved and they gave us drumsticks, they gave us everything that was requested by the nursing homes. And it was just, it's a buzz. You can't, you literally cannot be in a bad humour if you're surrounded by things like that. And then other people outside for Manor started to go, oh, that may be a good idea. And now we have, which is a bit mind blown, 19 partnerships in Northern Ireland with health trusts and councils and loneliness networks. And we have launched, which I am actually putting in a petition that I should be at this launch, by the way, in Coogara, New South Wales. We've gone global. That's my story. And all you need is one person to make one difference because it's like, it's like you and your boat, Grania. If you have a boat of kindness, everybody's going to get on there. They want on the ark of kindness. So that's that's my story and I'm sticking with it. Can I just say as well, um, you just started that off from scratch with nothing. Oh, and that's nothing. Why. <laughs> Not <laughs> just saying. So inspirational. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's such a positive way as well to move on into the next session. I think you haven't got questions. You just, you've just got huge level of support there in the chat. <laughs> Um, but can I just ask you, did you receive funding at nope. the beginning? Yep. Nope. Have you received funding since? Um, Tesco's, you know, when you know the, cha the community champion and you, know, you go, you've got a wee big shelf in there, love, could I put my kindness post box up for a week or two? And then people gave us money. So we, we used all that to make up hampers, things like colouring books and jigsaws that we weren't donated. So... Yep. But essentially, your post box runs with nothing. Absolutely it's... nothing. It runs with our currency is kindness. Yeah. And what a That's lovely it. way. What a lovely way to move forward. Thank you so much, Nilo, for sharing that.